Welcome to Pullback, the podcast that digs into the ethics behind everyday choices. We are a proud member of the Harbinger Media Network, and you can check out our partner shows at harbingermedianetwork.com. I'm Kyla Hewson. I'm here with Kristen Pugh. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. And today we are joined by special guest Alexandra Sundersing. Hello. Hi. You were with us in one of our very first episodes where we talked about sugar, and we've had so many compliments about that episode. That's nice. Thank you. You're joining us today to do a reactions episode. We love doing these where we'll watch a documentary or read a book. And this time we read something called The Nutmeg's Curse by Amitav Ghosh. Like, well, I guess the full title is The Nutmeg's Curse, Parables for a Planet in Crisis. And I'll be honest, I didn't know what I was getting into when we decided on this. Why did you choose this book, Kristen? It sounded cool. And also I wanted to learn more about nutmeg. Which I (laughs) sort of did, but the book is mostly about colonialism. (laughs) It's not about nutmeg. Nutmeg is like the... It's like an organizing parable. Yes, exactly. So for our listeners, I'm just going to read the inside cover of the book because it's really hard to describe. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you how the book describes itself and then we'll go into it. A powerful work of history, essay, testimony, and polemic, Amitav Ghosh's new book traces our contemporary planetary crisis back to the discovery of the New World and the sea route to the Indian Ocean. The Nutmeg's Curse argues that the dynamics of climate change today are rooted in a centuries-old geopolitical order constructed by Western colonialism. At the center of Ghosh's narrative is the now ubiquitous spice nutmeg. The history of the nutmeg is one of conquest and exploitation of both human life and the natural environment. In Ghosh's hands, the story of the nutmeg becomes a parable for our environmental crisis, revealing the ways human history has always been entangled with earthly materials such as spices, tea, sugarcane, opium, and fossil fuels. Our crisis, he shows, is ultimately the result of a mechanistic view of the earth where nature exists only as a resource for humans to use for our own ends rather than as a force of its own, full of agency and meaning. Writing against the backdrop of the global pandemic and the Black Lives Matter protests, Gauche frames these historical stories in a way that connects our shared colonial histories with the deep inequality we see around us today. By interweaving discussions on everything from the global history of the oil trade to the migrant crisis and the animist spirituality of indigenous communities around the world, Nutmeg's Curse offers a sharp critique of Western society and speaks to the profoundly remarkable ways in which human history is shaped by non-human forces. And if you're left wondering, wow, what is this book about? Same. (laughs) (laughs) It was so much. There was so much going on in this. Had you guys read anything by Ghosh before? No, but now I'm definitely going to read The Great Derangement. Uh, <laughs> this book was awesome. Yeah, he's one of the most famous writers in India, I guess, but I I had never heard of him before. I've read two or three things by him. So I haven't read The Great Derangement, although from what I understand, this is sort of like a follow-up situation where, you know, he's already written some things about climate and the environment and its role in history. And then like, this is like the next of those. So I've read three of his books, two fiction and one nonfiction. All of them I really liked and would recommend. So I read The Glass Palace, which is a novel about Burmese royals who were deported by the British to India so that the British takeover of what is now Myanmar would, I guess, go off with less of a hitch. I wouldn't say it went off without a hitch. (laughs) And so they deported the royals and the royals lived in exile in southern India. I read that, which was like a, an interesting fictional entry point. And then I read, actually for my PhD for an independent study at one point, I read In an Antique Land, which is a nonfiction-ish. It has like moments that feel fiction-y, but it is nonfiction. Um, and it's basically the result of Ghosh's training as an anthropologist. And so he gets in depth on like intricate relationships that the community he did his field work with um, have. And then I read the first book in his Ibis trilogy, specifically because that's sort of like a historical entry point into some of the stuff that we read about in The Nutmeg's Curse. And there's uh, some 
stuff about indenture in the Sea of Poppies, which is the first book. So that is how I ended up at that, is that it's one of the few fictional representations of indenture um, that I knew about when I was starting my PhD. And I was like, wow, people don't write about my topic in nonfiction. Guess I'll go read this novel. And it promptly got buried in comps lists and didn't finish the trilogy. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, we couldn't have picked a more perfect guest to talk about this book then. You've read so much of his work already. Yeah, and it turns out there's just like a shocking amount more. (laughs) So (laughs) I invite all your listeners to dig in. There, There is a through line. They're not all quite as like ready for mass market topical moments as the nutmeg's curse but his writing is really good across the board in very different ways in the fiction so i would invite people to bite into the fiction a little bit too what did you guys think of the nutmeg's curse i think the nutmeg's curse is one of the most interesting books i've read in a really long time would be sort of my first impression it was really well written it was a really interesting and wide-ranging argument, which you don't get a lot. It sort of pulls together threads from history that explain like many of the different problems of our current order, like not only the climate crisis, but also problems with inequality, and ties it in not only to capitalism, which is, I think, a pretty common argument among um, environmentalists today, but also the preservation of power and how that actually is really fundamental to the capitalist um, and like Western colonial story. So I really enjoyed it from that perspective. I think we can maybe talk a little bit about vitalism. You know, maybe this is my like Anglo, uh, you know, Westernism showing, but I had a hard time with that argument. (laughs) Um, But I I generally really enjoyed the book. It had some really cool ideas that I hope we'll unpack a little bit more. Um, Not least of which was these ideas around terraforming and, uh, you know, the climate crisis as like biopolitical war. It's really cool ideas. Yeah, I think for me, the biopolitics stuff was like a really big rethink that I had to do about whether or not I felt like he put the evidence for the argument there, because it's not out of the realm of stuff that I read a lot for work. um, But it's sort of a, I guess, a more direct formulation, like he kind of didn't beat around the bush about it. And so... I really appreciated the way that the book is written because I think the stuff that he's covering is really hard, um, not least of which I think that a less careful or less practiced writer might have had a harder time getting a book to mass print that pretty directly says climate change is kind of racist. And so I was really impressed at how seemingly smoothly that's woven in. Yeah, he lulls you into a false sense of security with a story from the 1600s and then is like, bam, refugee crisis. Yeah, yeah. So I I think that I was prepared for, but still really pleasantly surprised by. I don't know if I had a hard time with vitalism, but I kind of was like left not entirely knowing what to do with it in my own life. Like, does it demand that I immediately become vegetarian? Does it mean that I should just feel sad when I eat meat? Like some of that at like the very basic level and then at the more wide ranging level, like what does that mean about doing things like adapting environments to climate or like actively selecting different species of even plants? It left me with a lot of like ethics questions, I guess. So I'm just going to jump in here. And for the listeners who haven't read the book, which is probably almost all of them, can you guys talk about vitalism, what it is specifically, and how this book addressed it, and what your problem was? So from my understanding, Ghosh is arguing that vitalism is the word we can use to hold a place for the idea that any living thing has some way of actively contributing to history. So for example, like it doesn't matter whether or not plants can talk. If plants can, to anthropomorphize them a little bit, make choices about where they do and don't grow better and sort of like spread their leaves in that direction, for example, to catch more sunlight, then like that is an active historical choice and not just like a random thing that happens. So he's sort of expanding the idea that things can make choices that direct history as long as they are alive, whether or not they are doing aliveness in a human way. Oh, I love that description. Great job. Okay, Kristen, let's uh, <laughs> let's go through your points. I wanted to start by talking a little bit about 
the contrast to vitalism, actually, which is, you know, Western colonialism's mechanistic vision of the world, um, because in many ways, it's sort of uh, the opposite of what Lex just described vitalism as, right? Um, And it's really important to the argument that's made in the book, this idea that Western colonization actually comes with this ideology where man is the subduer of everything. He talks not only about like subduing nature, but also subduing um, indigenous populations in places where the colonization is happening and also, you know, subduing women, um, you know, uh, many other populations. And he, he talks about how this sort of concept of like the world as a machine um, and nature as something to be subdued as being something that was really necessary for an economy based on extracting resources. So in order to be able to sort of create an economy where you're extracting through empire, you have to be able to remove this idea of earth as being sacred, earth as being sort of alive, which is inherent to a lot of cultures. And I thought that was a really interesting idea. I'm wondering if anybody else had thoughts on that portrayal in the book. Um, did that make sense? Did that argument make sense to you guys? Did it, was it persuasive for you? It was one of my favorite parts of the book, actually. I really, really liked the way that he tied that in because you don't see that a lot in discussion with climate change specifically is the idea of how alive the earth is. I mean, you probably do if you're listening to like indigenous activists, but that's just like because of my Western viewpoint, it really made me re- like rethink a lot of the education that I had received as a kid and and makes me think about like, like a lot of the stuff he talks about is so spiritual. And when I was younger, I would have scoffed at it. And now I'm like, well, actually, like the world is dying and everything I've ever learned is evil. So I really liked the way he took it and tied it into modern science and history. For me, it also is at its most compelling when he's pointing out how assumed the mechanistic viewpoint is in Western society. So the like immediate example that comes to mind for me, because I'm always like, how do you make this accessible to a first year college student? <laughs> the immediate thing that comes to mind for me in Canada is that the like official title of the country is the Dominion of Canada. And at least part of that is rooted in the Bible verse about man having dominion over a list of things, including the earth. So I think the argument's at its most persuasive when it's rooted in that unpacking of how these ideas get handed down for so long that they become assumptions for some people and are just built into entire worldviews and how that wasn't always the case. Because I think when we talk about how it wasn't always the case, that means there's room for us to talk about how it doesn't have to be that way. So for example, even if you notice that the Dominion of Canada is named such because of a Bible verse, you also can go read things about Christian environmentalists who specifically interpret the same Bible verse to mean that they have like a job of stewarding. And so I think there's like most imaginative potential in the argument when he is sort of doing that back and forth between things that seem super far removed, like the 1600s, and then present day things like the refugee crisis. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I'm wondering about like on the other side, this sort of idea that you know, this vitalist idea that landscapes are alive, or that like, in, in some way, he's, he's sort of arguing that the climate crisis is this reaction to Western colonialism. Uh, and I'm wondering, do you buy into the idea that like non human actors can exert that sort of causal power? Do you think that we need to sort of imbue some agency, um, in a sense, to the natural world? And if so, what does that agency look like? Um, And how do we do that without sort of ascribing like specific intentions to the ways that trees grow and things like that? Kristen, thank you for asking, because I had the same question while I was reading this part (laughs) where I was like, oh, this goes so far beyond my like circle of knowledge that it it made me think a lot, which I think, I mean, obviously, that's great for a book to do. But What it made me think of specifically, and this is not to answer your question, so hopefully Lex has something better for you, but (laughs) it made me think specifically of when we were doing our episode on periods and we were talking about period huts and how some women are still forced to spend the week that they're having their period in a hut. And it's because of like superstitions that 
are culturally carried forward from, you know, especially rural places. And I'm like, okay, so how do I tell the difference between something that is actually really important, like ascribing agency to the natural world, which I actually think he made a really good argument for. And and I've been thinking like the more mushrooms I take, (laughs) (laughs) the more I think that that's actually true. But then where do we, where do we stop it from becoming like, okay, now women have to go into period huts, which is like maybe a weird thought to have had, but it it was the thought that I had. So I'm sharing it with you now. (laughs) Okay. I love this as a transition for me because I'm about to say something that I am sure sounds ridiculous, which is I am a firm believer that the difference between a lot of science and magic is just whether we have adapted a vocabulary to describe the process of what's happening. And so for me, I try and put myself in the position of like, you know, what if I hadn't read anything about the nervous system, right? Then, you know, if I saw a guy in my town, which for some reason is in a Western, um, if I saw a guy in my town who never drew first in a duel, but always won the duel and survived, I might think like that guy is magic or like that guy has like some kind of amulet that keeps him safe. You know, if I read some stuff about basic neuroscience, I might find out that actually your part of your brain that does the stuff that you intentionally decide to do, like pick something up or draw a gun is slower than the part of your brain that reacts to stuff. And so the guy who draws second in the duel is faster because he's not consciously deciding to draw the gun. But the difference between those two is like, I don't know, sometimes it's several hundred years until anyone has explained or researched that phenomenon at all. But sometimes the difference between that being magic and that being science is just literally whether you had access to certain kinds of information or whether that information was put into terms that you can understand in a way that's consonant with your worldview. I think the the mushrooms maybe are an assistive device in this situation, Kyla. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one who had like wild thoughts while I was reading this part because like it was such interesting writing and it was such interesting ideas tied into things that I don't normally connect together like history, the climate crisis, the refugee crisis, the pandemic and Gaia, the natural world having agency and Yeah, I'm glad I'm not the only one who was like, let's go on a tear on this one. (laughs) I actually, Kyla, I had a third and totally separate ridiculous thought when I was reading this part of the book. I went into a whole sort of thought process around, because in a way he's sort of ascribing agency to the earth. And it's, it's not, I don't think you necessarily have to believe that earth is intending to fight back in order to buy the argument. But it did make me think like, We think about ourselves as like discrete organisms that are very sort of separate and autonomous and independent. But like as science progresses, we find that like we're made up of a a ton of like, you know, bacteria and other kinds of organisms. And we don't really understand like how information transfer happens. And so I don't know if it's that much of a stretch to think that there may be some kind of like linkage that exerts itself over cultures and societies. And there may be some kind of like information transfer we're not accounting for. So I don't know, it just had it really got me thinking about like what the nature of life is <laughs> when you, when you don't think about everything as being this sort of like linear, logical, like X causes Y a machine does this. You can think about like more complex systems and maybe, maybe we're not like accounting for all the complexity in the way that the earth functions. I don't know. It was a really interesting thought process that I had. I don't know if I came to anything like in terms of an outcome. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I thought it maybe just clarified the idea that we don't know what we're doing. And the more we realize that, (laughs) the better off we'll be. (laughs) And like, we can't understand everything around us. And I'm constantly like learning things that are like, that 10 years ago, I would have thought were stupid. So, you know, like, I really liked it. I really liked it. And I think it made me think about the nature of reality as well. And then when he tied it to the idea that white colonialism specifically 
thinks that they're going to be okay in the climate crisis. I had to like really sit with that because as a white person who is very climate anxious, there is a big part of me that's like, well, I'm in Vancouver. And even though our roads washed away last year, I'll probably be fine. Like, like deep down, that feeling sits there, you know, because it always has been fine, as he says in the book. And I thought that that was a really, really important, like, I'm sure I'm probably jumping ahead and you were going to talk about this later, but it just ties so well to the idea of like, not understanding the world around us and thinking that we do so deeply that we refuse to learn. I think too, there's, um, there's really something to unpicking what we think agency is supposed to be, which like is 40% of my job is writing about agency right now. Um, So it's like totally on the brain for me. But I think for me, the agency argument is a real wake up call for a lot of people because it requires us to consider that human agency, unless you're willing to completely give up the idea that we have it, is constrained at all times. And I think that's very disorienting at first glance. I think if you drill down a little bit, it's not that disorienting. Like it is true that you can't breathe unassisted underwater because you're a human. And like that does constrain what you can do with your life. It may not feel like a meaningful constraint unless you really want to be a fish. (laughs) But like we have found workarounds precisely because we had the agency enough to make the choice to go see exploring and we had enough desire and drive to want to do that. So we found a workaround for the constraint on our agency, which is that we can't breathe underwater and we built submarines eventually. And that is, you know, like a stacked up result of a bunch of choices made over a long period of time by many people in many places. But I think one good thing about the way agency is presented in this book is that you have to confront that if living things engage in actions with or without actively making choices the way we think about ourselves making choices, then you have to think about what we are constrained by. And and that's helpful because that puts us in a position to think about working around things or working with things instead of working against. And I think, you know, so much of the dialogue about climate right now is about stopping it. And a lot of climate activists are saying, that's not really helpful, guys. It's already happening. We need to work with the change that's already underway. We need to work around the change that's already underway, not against it. There's no point in working against rising sea levels that have already risen. We need to account for the fact that the sea level has risen and work on what is possible and sustainable to prevent more of it, not pretend it away or reverse it. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I definitely hadn't connected that side of agency to the argument that was being made. So really insightful, Lex. I wonder if we could talk about terraforming a little bit, because that's sort of like the next thread that is talked about in the book after this idea that like a mechanistic um, ideology is necessary for Western colonialism, then talks about how terraforming is an inherently colonial concept. And even though it's sort of something we think about a lot of the time in sci-fi, you can think about it as the colonial project of creating neo-Europes. I'm wondering if either of you have thoughts on uh, terraforming from the book. The terraforming argument, I kind of wasn't expecting somehow. I don't know why. (laughs) It totally made sense to me once it was laid out, but it wasn't the first thing I thought of when I thought about the, like, I guess, back of the book argument or summary. I do think the connection to sci-fi is a little bit of a through line from the previous book, The Great Derangement, because I'm, if I'm understanding the reviews that I've read correctly, part of the argument in The Great Derangement is that we have had like a failure of imagination in not writing enough climate apocalypse stuff to help us understand what we might be going through. So I saw some continuity there with my imagined view of the book I have not yet read. (laughs) But the terraforming stuff for me made a ton of sense. Like I found it the easiest argument to digest possibly because like there are so many instances if you even just drive around like Northern Ontario, not even Northern Ontario, you don't even have to go that far from Toronto. You can just drive to Kitchener and like 
they didn't even name them different things when they made new towns. They were like, oh, I really miss Kitchener. I guess we'll name this town Kitchener. I mean, Kitchener is not a good example because we renamed it in World War II. But the idea is the same. Like, New York was New Amsterdam, and now it is New York. It's it's not a crazy creative naming process on the North American continent. <laughs> yes. I also really liked this idea of terraforming as a form of biopolitical warfare. Do either of you have thoughts on that? Oh, man. <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to lie. This required me to revisit my own notes because I was like, what's biopolitics again? <laughs> so as far as I understand it, Gauche's argument is basically that whatever form of terraforming colonizers engaged in, whether it was like clear-cutting forests or whether it was more metaphysical and was renaming towns after things in Europe, all of that project is a form of warfare that is biopolitical, parentheses, <laughs> biopolitics being an argument or concept from Michel Foucault's work, where the idea is that the state comes up with ways to control and enumerate who gets to live and who gets to die, and in what circumstances they are allowed to live or die or made to live or die. And so Gauche's extension on biopolitics is to say that the way colonization happened was by terraforming, and terraforming is an action that is inherently about making people live or die at all and or in certain ways. And I think the thing that helped me understand it the most was his explanation of how eliminating particular species of plants or animals particularly when those are keystone species, not necessarily for an ecosystem, but perhaps for a culture, even if they are also keystone species that hold up an entire ecosystem, that is a way of eliminating a way of life, not just eliminating an animal. Like when colonizers would destroy buffalo herds or bison herds to drive out uh, native populations. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, removing a species that is integral to everything in that environment being healthy and pro in proportional relationship to each other is not just a like fun hunting expedition because hunting is popular in England. It is the act itself is inherently loaded with ideas about what deserves to live and die, what kinds of lifestyles live and die, what kinds of peoples live and die, and how they should or shouldn't do that. Did you guys find it persuasive? Yeah, I, I really did. I, I also really liked um, the extension of, so one of the things that, that Ghosh was saying in the book, after he had sort of talked about killing animals and things like that as a way of um, asserting order or whatever, um, he also talks about like this idea of natural forces, that when you're engaging in terraforming in a way that is a weapon, um, you can also sort of distance yourself from being the cause by sort of treating it as natural forces. And that this is something that's often argued in the context of like the, the illnesses that were brought over to the Americas uh, by Western colonizers. Um, and he sort of talks a little bit about how um, this was sort of like treated as an inevitability. And like there's still to this day academic debate that Lex probably, you know, way more about than me, about like whether there was an intention ascribed to that. But the reality, um, at least Ghosh argues, is that people did know, at least in some cases, um, you know, smallpox blankets were used as a weapon. There's documented evidence of that. There's this kind of like interesting tension where terraforming can be used as a method of war, either intentionally or, or maybe not as intentionally. Um, and like in a way, it's, it's less proximate than, you know, just shooting somebody in the face. Um, and so maybe it allows you to like feel less bad about colonizing. I don't know. I, I just thought that was a really interesting argument. It's something I'd never thought of it before. Kristen, you just connected a thought for me when it comes to that vitalism where it's like we have the agency even if the intention isn't there. So I think that's something that's really interesting too when he when he compares like Earth as a living as a living thing that has agency, but maybe when it's throwing storms at us, the intentionality doesn't exist. It's just how things are. It's just how it's working back. Well, and on, on the flip side of that, like 
we can maybe see the same process happening with climate inaction right now, right? I mean, I think it's really poignant that we're recording this at the same time as 33 million people or more have been displaced in Pakistan due to flooding from the climate crisis. Even if it's hard to trace the causal chain back um, to climate change on that, we sort of have an onus, and that is partially a cause, a cause that like we, we own, you know, because we've not taken enough climate action. And I don't know, I just, I've been sitting with that kind of thought for a little while. I think, too, that this plausible deniability part of the terraforming argument is a really good way to highlight how mutually exclusive the vitalist argument is from the mechanistic way of seeing the world. Because if the world is just an input-output machine, then the inputs, it doesn't really matter whether you control them or not because the world will process them. And so colonization looks a little bit like intentional acts like clear-cutting a forest or engaging in a war, and a little bit like things we can't control, like a flood in this town. But if your argument is vitalist, then the question of human agency is a little bit more muted. It's a little bit more on equal footing with all the other inputs that get processed into a historical event. And I think that if you're not careful, can lead to the same kinds of plausible deniability uh, instead of the sort of like, I guess, humbling in the face of how small we are that I think Ghosh is actually aiming for. I think the other thing about the plausible deniability is that it really highlights the extent to which it requires humans to only think that the choices we make that are impactful are the ones that at all stages we're fully in control of. When in reality, there are lots of things that you can do that are unintentionally dangerous that the intentional choices you make can make less dangerous. Like, you know, you can not leave sharp objects out near children. You know, you don't have to be the child choosing to pick them up for that to be something you can or can't avoid with your conscious adult choices. But I think this sort of plausible deniability, man, can't control the mosquitoes model of history does let humans get away with maltreatment of each other, not in exclusively, but like us and the environment. It lets us get away with like, man, who knew there'd be less oxygen if we clear cut the Pacific Northwest? That's weird. <laughs> part of that is, yeah, we could avoid the cutting down of trees. But part of that is also like, there are other things going on that we don't control that are contributing to the same ecosystem. And that can be a convenient excuse. I think that the contrast between vitalism and the machine understanding of the world is really good in his examples of warfare and disease, because it allows us to really closely zoom in on how often we will like negligently behave instead of maliciously behave, and then assume that it's not our fault as a species. I used to have a really mechanistic view of things like, okay, we're all machines and input in, input out. But the more I learned about like economic theory, the more I'm like, oh no, every everyone as a human being is unpredictable. And if we are the same as the creatures around us, therefore, like, how can we predict, you know, how plants and animals will behave based on guesses when we can't even predict how we'll behave? You know, I don't know. That's just a thought that I've been having with this mechanistic versus vitalistic, this thought process he's put into my head. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting argument. And I, I want to to talk a little bit about this idea of world as resource, um, which is part of this sort of mechanistic ideology of colonization that's talked about in the book. Um, and one of the things that he says in the book is, you know, like outside of the bandas, nobody sings about nutmeg, which is technically untrue because in a 2014 Christmas special, John Legend did sing about nutmeg <laughs> on Stephen Colbert. <laughs> but that's maybe the exception that proves the rule. Um, but the world is resource <laughs> ideology is about like how when you have a mechanistic worldview, you really reduce the value of things to being a commodity. So things have no meaning in, in excess of what their utility is. And to see the world in this way requires not just sort of physical subjugation of people or of a land, 
but it's also a specific idea of conquest that's um, conquest as extraction, which I thought was a really interesting idea. And that that ends up being omnicidal ultimately, which was a very strong claim, (laughs) but I thought was really interesting one. This idea that like, if conquest is a process of extraction, you have to consume and consume and consume and eventually you boil the planet, you know? So what did you guys think about that? Did you buy that argument? (laughs) Are we all screwed? I mean, I also thought omnicidal was very strong wording, but I was also like, "Eh, maybe we deserve that wording. It's pretty obvious to anyone who's ever listened to our podcast that excessive consumption is going to eventually boil the planet. So I didn't think he was too far in left field for that one. (laughs) I was like a little stressed out by the term omnicide. Killing everything is bad. I just, I know that that's like the most reductive and childish response to this, but I just was like, oof, did you really have to go there? (laughs) I think like to point at something that both of you have referenced earlier, like Omnicide feels like such a strong intense word for what's going on precisely because like I locate myself in a very privileged position. I think that if you're looking at this from a flooded area in Pakistan right now, it it probably does feel pretty apt. Like it probably doesn't seem inaccurate to say that it's like totally consuming the way we live right now. That being said, I think you know, this idea of world as resource doesn't have to be bad. And one like laudable thing is Ghosh's engagement with North American indigenous theorists. I will say there's not a ton of stuff about indigenous theory in other places that have like a really deep tradition of even academic writing about it. Like Australia has obviously like a tradition of indigenous systems and worldviews like every place has and those not all of us are privy to um, for protective reasons that are pretty understandable if you've read anything in this book but I think also like there is an academic tradition of expressing those worldviews in not just North America and I think though one thing that seems so far in my experience generalizable is that most indigenous worldviews and philosophies that I've read you know the world is a resource It's just one that you're supposed to respect and engage with proportionately. You're not not allowed to eat animals in any of the traditions that I've read about so far, but you're not allowed to eat a wasteful amount that you don't need. And you're supposed to not just eat them, but also use the parts for medicine, use the fur to keep warm, use the skin to waterproof things or build a residence. Like it's not about not consuming, it's about respect. Yeah. It's about respecting your consumption. (laughs) I think to some extent, my own religious upbringing was very much framed in terms of like, if you can't make it, you shouldn't take it out of this world willy nilly, which like, I mean, in my own upbringing, you can't make it quite literally applies to everything (laughs) because I am neither handy nor God. So (laughs) that was a bit totalizing as well. But I, I mean, like, The principle is somewhat similar in that, you know, not wasting means thinking very carefully about your consumption choices. It doesn't mean not consuming. Yeah. And I I do think there's a difference between maybe the word resource was wrong. Maybe world as a set of commodities is more accurate. Because I think when you do start to sort of reduce things to commodities, it creates problems. And and one example that I just want to draw on from the book, uh, which Ghost describes as unhinged, um, and I also agree as unhinged, is uh, when the Dutch East India Company decided that they wanted to control the supply of um, nutmeg and clove trees so that they basically would kill all of the nutmeg and clove trees that existed on any other islands than the Bandas and Ambon Island. And I just want to, I want to read a quick uh, excerpt that he has from a Dutch governor in 1686. Uh, that was fighting this war against the nutmeg trees. Your lordships would find it difficult to comprehend how many spice trees there are on most of the islands in this area. If we truly intend to uproot these trees, we must do it with hundreds of men divided into groups and spread throughout the forests. For this, we must have people who have the desire and inclination to carry out the work since the forests are so thick that a man can barely raise his head. Moreover, they are often full of thorns and bushes which tear to shreds whatever a man is wearing and can damage his legs, hands, and face. 
The places are many, and the uprooting of spice trees appears to be nearly an impossible task. It is the most difficult and exhausting work that one can imagine. Sometimes the spice trees are so inaccessible that one must push up the thorny rattan vines in order to get to them. There is also the danger of breaking a leg. Sometimes the spice trees are surrounded by so many other trees and bushes that one cannot see them, over half come back sick or incapacitated from these expeditions. So this is like uh, an excerpt that Gauche is using to basically show that this this weird desire to to get rid of all the trees, which went on for like a century, um, is more or less a war against the nutmeg trees. (laughs) And you can see, like, there's a lot of violence in that passage. And he's sort of comes up with this idea of the nutmeg sort of taking revenge on the colonizers. And I was wondering if you found that analogy persuasive, um, if you think it's something that we could take literally or if it's something that we should just treat as an analogy. I have a thought that's a little bit off topic, which is that not only was that completely unhinged, but so was the idea that they took over the Banda Islands and then killed most of the people who lived there. And then the ones who didn't get murdered, they brought back as slaves to teach everyone else how to raise the nutmeg. And for me, that was the most upsetting part of the book. I was just like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, Yeah, Kyla, mine was unhinged in a zany way. Yours was unhinged in a deeply upsetting way. (laughs) Yeah. So that's what I was thinking of when you were like, uh, unhinged. But yes, also the tree thing is wild. (laughs) Like, If you can't even get to the trees, why kill them? No one's going to be harvesting from them. (laughs) What a waste. What a waste of life. What a waste of energy. A hundred years. They did this for a hundred (laughs) years. If anything could be said of colonialism, it's wasteful. (laughs) Yeah, I think the I'm still jury out on whether or not the analogy works for me of the revenge of the trees. I do think though that there's something like really crisp and easy to see of just how wasteful the specific style of colonization that Gauche is talking about in the Banda Islands here is because it's not exclusivity as in we want to be the only ones who know how to do this or who bring it to market it's also exclusivity in terms of like property and control and enumeration which i mean like is not completely surprising rewind a couple minutes to that whole foucault section but this is people enumerating trees And they are so hell-bent on knowing exactly where every single possible slip in the system is where someone could possibly get a nutmeg tree, that they are like hacking through bushes that if you subscribe to an agency theory of the natural world, like the natural world has built itself up in a way that says very much, I do not want you here, please go away. They are so hell-bent on enumerating and owning all the trees that they are hacking through other things to get there with no like information or understanding on whether or not you know are the rattan vines there helping do they have a symbiotic relationship to the trees do they make the nutmeg better are they like is it a corn beans and squash situation where having all three together is making one or all of them better, or, you know, they don't know that. They're just hacking down the vines. And I think that tells us a lot about the philosophy of, like, property and exclusivity that's at work. The only other place that I've sort of read about this war on nutmeg so poignantly is I was reading a book called Stoned by Aja Raiden that is about sort of, like, the quest for precious gems and humanity's understanding of like what is valuable and what is rare and this comes up in the context of trading a island in that archipelago for what is now new york because the british have hold on one island where there is some nutmeg growing and according to that author's um, recollection of the historical evidence the dutch government is at war with the British government and they basically tell their local general like 
no harming British people. We're trying to make peace right now. But he is really in on his mission to own all the nutmeg. And so he sneaks to the British island in the night with a boat and lights it on fire in a very, very clear, if I can't have it, no one can sort of situation. And when you put that alongside things like, you know, dipping individual nutmegs into quick lime so that they're sterile when they go to market so that you can still use them as a spice, but you can't plant them and get a nutmeg tree. Like this is a very ownership oriented philosophy on world as resource that like whether or not the nutmeg can take its revenge, I don't know. But the philosophy that's at work to get to the nutmegs needing to take revenge is very violent and it's not just violent against humans it's violent in a lot of ways and on a lot of levels using the argument about nutmeg and colonialism he argues that today we can see kind of the same thing happening with fossil fuels that in a lot of ways it's about ownership and it's about power and it's about a particular conception of like private property ownership or exclusive property ownership so what, one of the things that he says is that it's really about the ability to deny energy supplies to rivals, that that's what's important about oil today. Uh, and personally, I thought that that's pretty hard to deny. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, I fully agreed. I was I thought I thought that because this was near the end of the book and I thought he did a really good job of tying together the history of colonialism and the powers that ran it. And how nutmeg was one of those powers back in the day. And now the power is fossil fuels, right? And that's where people that's where people get their power from. And the idea that the world is burning now because everybody has access to fossil fuels and white colonialism used to think like, oh, only uh, only we will have it. So it's fine if we burn it. And it's like, no, that's not how it works now. And I thought I thought the way that he tied that all together at the end was so powerful and so interesting and also so accurate. Like, absolutely, we are fighting to get off of fossil fuels. We could have gotten off fossil fuels decades ago. We could have if we really wanted to. And we could get off of them tomorrow if we put our effort into it. But it's going to take us another 30, 40, 50, 60 years at the rate that we're going because the powers like that B don't want to let go of the power that they have. And they'd rather watch the world burn <laughs> than than give up the power they have. And like the idea of like going to the island and burning down all the trees. If I can't have it, then no one can, right? Yeah, it ultimately all comes back to the Lorax. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a really long version of the Lorax. <laughs> yeah, if you can't get through the first two chapters of this, the Lorax will do... <laughs> Absolutely not a thing I will tell my students. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you'll assign this book, Lex? I think I can see assigning a couple of chapters, which chapters would probably depend on the time period in the class. But I do think that this is a helpful sort of historical through line for talking about climate racism and race based elements of climate justice because it has like some pretty clear case studies um, that let us see that thoughts about the environment are often connected to thoughts about the people who are from that environment. So I think, you know, I can see doing some of that. Um, depends on the geography, I guess, whether I'd use oil or nutmeg on a given day. I frankly still can't believe how many ideas he squeezed into a book that doesn't seemed that big. So I was like, halfway through the book, I was like, what am I reading right now? <laughs> it felt like an episode of The Simpsons where it starts with like one completely outlandish idea and then like pivots into something that you were not expecting <laughs> and then like ties it up together at the end. Yeah, the book is actually longer than I thought it was. And I think it's like on a technical level, I think there's some really good chapter length management going on. But I, I think that part of it is that writing style that we were talking about at the beginning where the new words are very minimal, but the new ideas are not very minimal. So there's lots of new ideas being introduced here, but not everything has a flashy name like vitalism. Yeah. And it takes a lot of things that we kind of know intrinsically and ties them together and puts them into words. So I felt like every time I read something that was kind of a new idea. I felt like I already knew it. And he was just pointing it out to me. <laughs> I think the oil argument was 
a little bit difficult for me, if only because I think it accidentally buys into that idea that there is like a scarcity that we have to be bound by. Whereas a lot of the, I guess, like counter arguments to how things could have been that Gosh is making are saying that like scarcity is only an issue when we have this totalizing way of consuming things. And if we have like a respectful or balanced way of consuming things, then the non-infinite supply or non-exhaustive supply of things is not really the biggest issue because there is time to replenish and there's proportional use of what is available. So I was kind of a little bit confused by the oil stuff because I was like, well, like if we had dug oil out of the ground, but we had a more equitable way of using the energy produced by it, like, would it still be a problem in his eyes? Or would that be okay? Would that still be adding as much bad to the general climate situation as we have? Or would it not have done that? I wasn't exactly sure how the alternative timeline of history shakes up with the oil argument. He did kind of bring up the idea that if population was brought down, it still would be a problem because the consumption of the big consumers would, like, you could get rid of most of the people on the planet Earth, and we would still have a problem with greenhouse gases because of the level of consumption of the 1%. And so I felt like in that way, he kind of addressed the issue that you were talking about, Lex, the idea that, like, no, we really do need to get off of fossil fuels. But I mean, I guess, yeah, if the 1% weren't so wasteful, maybe maybe his idea is that it wouldn't be such a problem. But I felt like in the like he was discussing the idea that like, oh, people want to get rid of all of the other people in other countries because then you can keep consuming. And it's like, that's not how it works, though. And I felt like he kind of addressed that well. I don't know if that makes sense the way I said it. I, I think that makes sense, Kyla. For me, what I found the most maybe important about the fossil fuel argument was how it sort of ties in capitalism with this idea of empire. So it's, it's not just that oil is this useful commodity. It's also that it really serves entrenched powers um, and that it has like a geopolitical purpose. And that's why it's been so hard to sort of supplant. I agree with you, Lex, though, that there's like a little bit of difficulty in terms of like the inherent argument about fossil fuels. That if it's just about like the fact that the dominant classes own it, maybe that's a more shallow critique. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but I, I agree with you that it is a problem. I encourage listeners to read the book themselves and then let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Please sound off on Twitter and tell us how to read this chapter. Properly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it felt at, at points that chapter to me felt a little bit like that meme of, um, I think it's from Always Sunny in Philadelphia, where the guy's got like the conspiracy board or whatever. Oh, Charlie. <laughs> Ah, yes, they're the same ports. <laughs> but otherwise, I did generally buy the argument. I think it's a good sort of like replotting of just in case you missed that the people in 1600 might still be the baddies in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good review in that sense for me. And I think like, you know, that part of the argument was from the work I do a little easier to hang on to because I was like, yeah, that tracks like Britain still largely trying to own things and generally doing exploitations. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I wonder if this book was received differently by different colonial powers. You know, like, does this book get a different read in the US than it does in Britain? Did audiences respond to things differently in the Netherlands than they did in either of those countries? You know, I wonder if like, your country made its initial fortune by selling nutmeg and people, but doesn't have that many oil resources. Like, do you read the book differently than if your country is currently more engaged in exploitative labor practices elsewhere, for example? Well, I can tell you it's got almost five stars on Goodreads. So, <laughs> Oh, I'm kind of impressed by that, actually. Usually something so polemical doesn't get that good of a review. <laughs> what, what do you think is like the big takeaway from this book? If you guys each had one. What is the, the thing that you'll remember most from it? For me, I think it's the idea that the planet has agency or more agency than 
our mechanistic view has ever given it credit for and that I really need to spend a lot more time examining my Western education and my viewpoints on things because the more I learn about Indigenous culture and history from other religions outside of like Western Christianity, the more I'm like, oh, you know, just because I don't understand something doesn't mean it's not real or that it's stupid. And I I think that this book really did a great job of making me think more about that. And also uh, sitting with the whiteness that I carry in, in regards to the climate crisis and my level of anxiety. It came with like a preloaded, this is like a pithy takeaway for classroom for me. And then it came with like a, what personal work do I need to do takeaway? I think on like a very first reading or a very like assigning specific chapters reading of the book, it was a very easy packaging for many of our current problems have more historical roots than we'd like to acknowledge. But I think that, you know, that is kind of a slippery angle at which you can easily end up just saying there's no point in doing anything because I'm not the one that caused the problem. So on a personal level, the takeaway for me was that it's never really the technology or the items that create the problem. It's the ideologies. And so it doesn't really matter whether or not we switch away from one type of harm that is produced by a specific object if we don't also undo some underlying ways of engaging with each other that have been built up around that item or that environment. Yeah, I think that's a really good one. And I I will say that that sort of like broader point uh, is probably something that I'll think quite a lot about. But my takeaway um, that's much smaller, but it was just a fact that shocked me was the fact that it wasn't until 1978 that, like, Native beliefs were legalized in America. 1978! That's so recent. Did not expect to read that in this book, but there you go. These things are so recent. It's something that, like, I don't think we think about a lot. We think about, especially with reconciliation, we think about a lot of these issues as being, like, generations ago. And they're really, really, really not. They're really not. 1978, wow. Well, 1996 for the last residential school in Canada, so. So we'll be releasing this episode not too long before uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day, so maybe a useful point to end on. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. We definitely encourage you to pick up this book. If nothing else, every single person will take away something different. (laughs) If you want to get more from us, you can check out our huge back catalog. We're almost to like our 100th episode. We'll have to do something special soon. And thank you, Lex, for coming with us on this uh, fabulous book journey. It's You have such insightful things to say, and I don't know why we haven't had you back before now. You you should be a regular guest. I Like, get back here. (laughs) I'd love it. I'm here to inform you any things you need to know about depressing labor practices. It's our favorite thing to talk about. Is there anywhere that listeners can find you? Yes, I am probably easiest to find on Twitter, where I'm at A.T. Sundarsing. So... When you see my name in the notes for the episode, um, you'll also be able to see my Twitter. And it tends to be there that I put all the little articles that are making me think about things like this book did. So that would be a good spot to find me and my, uh, my thoughts. Love it. And you guys can find us on Twitter at Pullback Podcast. And you can find us on Instagram where I've been super active lately. If you really like spicy memes, I've been sharing a lot of those at Pullback Podcast. And if you want to listen to something else in our sort of field, you can check out more shows at the Harbinger Media Network on harbingermedianetwork.com. And we'll catch you on the next episode. Sweet, sweet nutmeg